Uh, Hey, I come across this story the other day. There was a preacher, had a, and his little boy asked him this question one day. He said, Daddy, I notice every Sunday morning when you first come out to preach, he said, you sit up on the platform, you bow your head. He said, what are you doing? And the father says, well, I'm asking the Lord to give me a good sermon. The little boy said, but why doesn't he? <laughs> so having said that, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you again for the chance to be here. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you open our uh, eyes to see what you want us to see, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from your word today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you've got a Bible there, uh, this collection of ancient documents, how many of you know it's not, it was never written, uh, originally intended to be stuck between two bits of leather and become the biggest selling book of all time? Do you know that? It was actually written over about 1,500 years uh, on three continents, uh, 66 different books uh, that all tell the same story, all point in the same direction. Uh, they're all ancient historical documents. So when people think, refer to the Bible as a book, I cringe a little bit because I think we take away a bit of the reality of what's written in these pages when we just approach it like a book. It's not just a book. Uh, imagine 1,500 years, people writing a story and not being able to necessarily collude completely with each other and the end result being a story that flows seamlessly from beginning through to end. I think that's an amazing, amazing thing. But if you've got one there, can you turn to the book of Philippians? It's in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. And just because I know in today's day and age, nobody brings Bibles to church anymore, I told Luke, would you put it up on the screen for me? So Luke's going to put that up on the screen for me any second now. Here we go. Let's read this together. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. Everybody say in need. Yep, I know what it is to have plenty. I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, one of the things I love about Rod is every day when I come to church on a Sunday morning, Rod has a joke for me. 10% um, of them I actually get. But when I get it, 100% of them are really, really funny. But every now and then I come up with one that I think trumps him. And I came up with a little story the other day. A guy goes to a psychiatrist's office and he sits down on the couch and the psychiatrist is there. And the psychiatrist says, tell me what the problem is. And the guy says this. He says, well, every day I wake up and one minute I feel like I'm a teepee. And then the next minute I feel like I'm a wigwam. And the psychiatrist puts his pen down, leans back in his chair, and he goes, I know what your problem is. You're too tense. You're too tense. I'm going to tell you now, it was way better than that. <laughs> it was way better than that. But here's the truth. The truth is we actually do tend to live in one of two tents in life. We tend to live in a place of contentment, or we spend time in a place of discontentment. We live in two different states of being, contentment, or discontentment. As a species, as a human race, uh, it actually appears that we're never truly contented in life. You ever notice that? It's, it's very hard to find uh, people that are actually truly contented with what they have. Uh, people who are truly contented with who they are. Or people who are truly contented with where they're actually at in life. The stage or the season of existence that they're in. Um, a couple of examples. We lived in India for many years. And you know if you go to India, Indians love light-coloured skin. Everybody in India wants their skin colour to become lighter. But then you come back here to Australia, and everybody here that's light-skinned, what are we doing? We're lazing in the sun all day, and everybody wants to be darker. No one's ever truly, truly satisfied. Certain nations you go to, and uh, it's prestigious for the body shape of a person to be bigger and larger. But then you might go to a European nation, and nobody wants to be larger. Everyone that's larger is trying to become thinner and skinnier and skinnier. My daughter came out to me the other day, and by the way, I have her permission to share this. She walked out to me the other day, and she had this stuff going on on her face. And I looked at her, and I said, oh, Chloe, are you going to go to school like that? You need to go and wash your face. Don't judge me for it. I, I didn't know these things. I'm learning still. I said, you've got to go wash your face. And she said, Dad? I said, what? She said, it's makeup. I said, oh, well, well, it looks like you haven't rubbed it in properly. You better go and rub it in properly. She said, you don't rub it in. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, it's meant to give the image or the look of having freckles. And again, I thought, isn't it funny? 
When I was a kid, nobody wanted freckles. Everybody tried to avoid freckles. Makeup was made to cover your freckles. Now you go get makeup if you've got non freckly features to put freckles on your face. Nobody's ever happy or ever truly contented. Henry George, he was an American economist and journalist, and he said this once. He said, Man is the only animal whose desires increase as they are fed. The only animal that is never satisfied. And I think there's a lot of truth in what Henry George had to say. Uh, In Proverbs 27, King Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived, Solomon actually said this. He said, death and destruction are never satisfied. Proverbs 27, 20. Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are human eyes. Neither are human eyes. We always want more, or bigger, or faster. There's always something out there that we we led to believe we need in order for our life to be more complete, or to be more happy, or to be more contented in life. We actually live in a world that's constantly trying to convince us that we don't have enough yet, that we are not enough yet, that we're not in the right place just yet. But if we would just get, and you can go and fill in the blank for yourself. If we would just go where they want us to go. If we would just wear what they want us to wear. If we would just purchase what they say we need to have, then our whole world could be very different. Easily assumed is the fact that Western culture deliberately breeds discontent. The Western culture deliberately breeds discontent. It's what our marketing gurus base what they do on. It's what people go to university and get educated to learn how do I how do I make how do I convince you that you need something that you don't actually need? And we buy it time and time and time again because we think that there's something at the end of that rainbow, but we get there and we realize that hang on, I'm still not happy. I'm still not satisfied. I still don't have everything that this thing promised it would give me. But here's the thing. If you're a person who battles with feelings of discontent, and I think all of us do in different areas of life, we battle with discontentment. Uh, It's hard not to battle with discontentment when the minute you turn on the radio or you turn on the TV or you go to the supermarket or you go to the shops or you go to school and you hear people talk, it's hard not to feel somewhat ripped off in life and think that there's something else out there that I need that's the missing piece of the puzzle. So if you're a person like that, then then take heart. You're not the only person that's ever been like that. As a matter of fact, I think if we were brutally honest, most people in this room would say there are areas of the world where they live in this place of discontentment. Whether it be what you have, whether it be the stage or season of life you find yourself in, whether it be who you are as a person. None of us have come to that full place of contentment yet. And it's interesting because several thousand years ago, a guy called Paul writes these words to a bunch of people in a church in a city called Philippi. And we just read them, and I'll read it again. He says, I'm not saying this. Hey? Wow, this this, happens live, doesn't it? What what, what are you showing me? What are you showing me? I filled in me what you said, and look where it is. Philippians 14, 12, unisex beauty salon. And it's in Uganda. There you go. There's a Ugandan beauty salon called Philippians... There you go. Well, look at that. This is how things roll around here, okay? Thank you for that, Keith. Awesome. So I'm just going to read Philippians 4, 11 to 13. It's live. We don't rehearse any of this. It just happens. It just happens. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Paul writing to, to the Philippian church. Now, the Philippians have gathered a donation, a hefty financial donation together, and have been able, through a series of events, to get that donation to Paul, who happened to be in need at that particular time. And Paul's responding to their generosity and what they've given to him. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And he sums it all up by saying, I can do all this. In other words, I can be in need, I can be in want, I can be in lack, and I can also have plenty. And I can manage and handle both of them successfully because I can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. There's a couple of things there that Paul gives us, a couple of little insights into uh, how can we begin to live a more contented life. Now, we're going to spend a few weeks on this, just so you know. So we've got probably three, four weeks. I just want to talk about this issue of contentment. All I want to do today is just lay a little bit of a foundation and just to get us to think. Because how many of you know it doesn't really matter what a preacher says in front of a congregation? It, it, it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't make a difference in your life. You know that? 
What I say right now will not make a difference in your life. What will make a difference is whether you take any of the stuff that the Word of God teaches us and you actually apply it and do it. That's where change takes place. That's where something different can happen. So you can listen and amen and high five and get excited and go, yes, we can even look at the Word of God and go, that's true. But if we don't live it and do it, we don't receive or walk in any of the benefits or the stuff that, that, that Jesus talked about that is waiting there for us to actually begin to not only know information, about, but to start to experience. We sang a song there about knowing the goodness of God in the land of the living. I love that idea because I don't think that God saved us so that we could just do this journey by ourselves, die, fall off the perch, then one day we get to hang out with Jesus. No, no, no. In fact, he was so, Jesus was so convinced that we weren't going to have to live that way that he said before he went, he made it very clear to his disciples, I have to go because if I don't go, guess what? The Holy Spirit, who's going to be with you right through to the end, he won't come. So I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can come and be with you. And the Holy Spirit will be living in you. And will help you experience God and understand God and give you the power to live out the stuff that God talks about. Because in my own human flesh, I'll be brutally honest, I don't want to do what God says to do. <laughs> There's nothing in my flesh that wants to obey God. I've got my own ideas and agendas. But by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me, I can live the way that God wants me to live and experience life the way God wants me to have it. Now, Paul, uh, Paul felt this way at some point. Paul must have felt discontented with his life at some point. And I don't know what was going around in his head at the time, but he felt like he needed to in this moment just give them a little lesson on contentment, what contentment looks like and how contentment comes about. So like all of God's secrets, God's secrets are not kept from us, but God keeps secrets for us so that we'll find them. Amen? God doesn't keep things from us, he keeps things for us. It's like anyone ever done an Easter egg hunt with their kids? Anyone ever done that? Or is that kind of old-fashioned? I don't know. Easter egg hunts. And, and, and you, you get the Easter eggs and you start to hide them. But they weren't trying to hide them so that the kids couldn't find the Easter eggs. I mean, what's the fun in that? You're, not, you're hiding them so the kids can find the Easter eggs when they go looking for the Easter eggs. And I think that's what the secrets of God, the mysteries of God are like. God's not hiding stuff from us. He's hiding it for us so that when we go looking for it, we find answers and we find things. And so Paul talks about this, this I've learnt this mystery, I've learnt the secret of contentment. And I just want to start today by just giving you three thoughts, three things that I think are part of this secret that Paul discovered that he's wanting to reveal and share with the Philippians. The first one's this, contentment is not first nature to us. Contentment is not first nature to us as human beings. You go right back to the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, I mean, can you imagine? In your wildest imaginations, can you imagine being Adam and Eve? According to what's written here in the book of Genesis, you got Adam and you got Eve and you got God. Does it get any better than that? Does it get any better? I mean, how many of us have, have, have ever, be honest, you've thought about the story of Adam and Eve and thought, those guys must have been so dumb. They must have been so dumb. I mean, they had the perfect world. It was them and God. And no sin, and no problems, and no lack, and no poverty, and no wars, and no disease, and, no, and they blew it because they thought that there was something else out there. See, they were convinced there's something else that we needed. The devil comes along and he goes, Is God saying you shouldn't eat? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, God's saying you shouldn't because God knows this. If you do, you'll become like God. Now, they were already created in the image of God, so you're not going to get any more in the image of God by doing anything other than just loving God because God made you in his image. But they were convinced by an external source, the devil, they were convinced that there's something else that you need in order to have true contentment, in order to be fully human, in order to be truly happy. So even in the most perfect environment... We can be seduced by external sources to think that we need something else that brings contentment into our world. But guess what? It didn't work for them, and it's probably not going to work for us either. Did you know on average, you're exposed, this is, this is averages, each human being in this room is exposed to 7,000 messages per day telling you that you need this, you need that, you have to have that, you should have this. You deserve this. 7,000 on average external voices and messages screaming at you, telling you what your life needs in order to be truly contented. Isn't that amazing? There's no way that we can have 7,000 voices screaming at us 
and drop our guard and think that we're not slightly being influenced by some of these things and getting dragged away. I, I, I went shopping, uh, and I don't shop a lot, right? And my wife will tell you this. I'm not a big shopper, but when I shop, baby, I shop. It's, it's like once you break that shopping seal, I'm in, right? And, 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 and so I'll, I'll buy nothing. I'll go for a year and I don't buy a thing. But then I go somewhere, and, and part of the reason why I don't buy that shirt is because if I buy that shirt, I know what happens. I'm going to buy that shirt, and then I'm just going to feel this freedom within me. And I go, I want that one too, and that one, and I'm going to get that one, and that one. And so I don't, I don't do a lot, but uh, it became a bit of a running joke on holidays because I bought a jacket. Because I mean, it's minus, it was minus one or minus three at one point in one of the places we stayed. It was freezing. So I bought a jacket, you know. But then I bought another jacket. And I felt like, I said, oh, that's a nice jacket too. And in the end, I had to pull myself back up. How many jackets do you need, Alan? You, you only got one body wearing it one day. You don't need 15 jackets. You know? But it's like th- this, this thing got in me and I just felt like, no, I need another. That, that jacket's awesome, but, but what, if, what, if, what if it's at different degrees? Maybe that jacket's going to be always... Oh, it's terrible. And I pull myself back and go, what are you doing, Alan? What are you doing? You don't need all these jackets. You don't need all these things. But I'm exposed to 7,000 different messages every day telling me that I do need all these other things. You know, if I would just support another rugby league team, I'd be much more contented. Some of the voices, they're speaking wisdom to me. I do know that, but not every voice. So the first thing Paul makes clear is that contentment is not first nature to us. It's not first nature to any of us. And the second thing he makes clear is that even though it's not first nature to us, contentment can be learned. You can learn to be content with your life. Now, I know there are probably some people sitting here going, but you don't know my circumstance. You don't know my bank account. You don't know my job. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Uh, I I don't. That's 100% right. I don't. I don't know. But what I do know is that Paul, this great man of God that didn't always have everything his own way, made this statement and he said, you know what? I wasn't born naturally contented, but here's what happened. Through a series of events, I had to learn how to be content. I had to actually learn how to be content. So if you're discontent in your life, the good news is this. You don't have to stay discontented with your life. You don't have to stay in that place of discontent. You can actually learn how to be contented. Isn't that that good news? Anyone sitting here with discontent in their life? That's good news for you today. You can actually learn how to be content with your life. Some of us don't want to learn how to be content with our life, you know? But being content doesn't mean resigning yourself to the life you have. We're going to talk about this in weeks to come. But right now, I just want you to know that one of the secrets Paul wanted to teach these Philippians is that you can learn to be this... You can, sorry, you can learn to be content. Paul had to learn how to be content in his life. Paul said, I had to learn how to live with plenty. Doesn't that sound weird? Doesn't it sound weird? Like, be real. He says, I had, I mean, if, if somebody walked up to you now and said, I'm going to give you your dream car, your dream job, your dream husband or wife, and a billion dollars like a pack of Kit Kats that never runs out. And then someone said to you, but you're going to have to learn how to be content with that. You'd be like, <laughs> whatever. Come on, bring it on, baby. But Paul's going, you know what? You've got to learn how to be content with a lot. So having a lot's not the answer to your discontentment because Paul says you can have a lot and still have to learn to be content. In other words, you can have a lot and still be discontent. So it's not a matter of what you have and don't have. Paul says, I had to learn how to have a lot. See, we don't know a lot about the background of the Apostle Paul, but you can put some things together based on information that he gives us that, that A, he probably came from a pretty well-to-do background, he had pretty influential family connections. That's what got him to his position in the synagogue uh, that he had and so on. He, he would have come from probably a fairly affluent sort of background based on the bits and pieces we can pull together from his writings in the New Testament. But he said, I had to learn to be content. Imagine having everything and not being content. Yet Paul's saying, just because you got it doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it. Just because you got it doesn't mean you'll learn the secret of having contentment in your life. You know, when we first got married and we moved to Bundaberg, me and Jackie, many years ago, I remember um, uh, we weren't there for too long and there was a story in the newspaper. And there was a man who had um, uh, driven himself to a park and had hung himself under a tree and was found by some friends a day or two later out by the river. This guy, for all intents and purposes, he had the latest model car. He had a fantastic, fantastic job. He had lots of money in the bank and he just married the most beautiful woman in the town. And yet here he was, 
admitting to the rest of the world that, you know what, you can have all the money you want. You can have the best job, the best car, the positions, the press. You can have it all, but it's still not going to be enough. There's still something missing inside this guy's life. And I think that's what Paul's getting at. You can have everything, but you can still be a very discontented person. You've got to learn how to be content with what you've got and where you are and who you are. And he also goes on and says, I had to also learn, we learn how to be content with nothing. Now, we all relate to that, don't we? <laughs> Every one of us, we look at that and we go, Amen, Paul, eh? I'll high-five that one. How do you learn to be content when you feel like you've got nothing? Now, for each of us in the room here, the concept of having nothing, if we look at it on a global scale, we're pretty well off. Anybody that lives in this nation right now, you're automatically in the top 75% of the most wealthy people in the world. If you've got a roof over your head and a car to drive and you've had a meal or two meals today, you're in that top percentage of people who are blessed and looked after in the world. We've got it pretty good, even though I myself may complain and whinge uh, because, you know, I'd like to have that and I wish... I... But at the end of the day, I'm blessed. I live in a great place and I'm looked after really, really well. But Paul says that he had to learn how to live with nothing. He had to learn how to be content in those moments where he had much, but also had to learn how to be content in the moments where he didn't have a lot. Now, that tells me this as well, that becoming content is not just about simplifying your life. Because you can have nothing, guess what? You've still got to learn. There's still a learning about how to be content. So some people go, I'll just give everything away, sell everything and won't have money like, like, like you know, let's make ourselves as poor as we can and life as simple as we can. We'll live on a farm, grow cabbages because it'd be cheaper to grow them now. They're too expensive. Um, and, and, and we'll live off carrots and so on and creek water and, and, and we'll be content. But you know what? Paul's saying, uh, you're missing the point. That's not going to necessarily give you contentment either because you're still going to have to learn in the midst of that situation this thing called contentment. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And then he says, I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. In other words, the Holy Spirit has taught me contentment through the ups and the downs of life. Anyone ever had ups and downs in their life? Yep. I'm the only person in this room that's had an up and down. Awesome. Oh, Elaine's had one. The rest of you, you're like this. Pray for me at the end. Oscar Wilde uh, once said this. He said, true contentment is not having everything, but in being satisfied with everything that you have. I think that's a really, really good statement. And the third thing that Paul gives us, we'll wrap it up. Third thing Paul gives us in terms of his secret, his discovery, this mystery of contentment. He says this, and we've already talked about it a bit. He says, contentment is not determined by circumstances. It's just not determined by your circumstances. We're led to believe it is, aren't we? We live in a world that tells us, based on our circumstances, whether we should or should not be happy. Something happens to us and people around us collectively presume to know how you should feel in that situation. Oh, you've just lost your job. You should feel really angry at the, what they did. You should be this. You should feel happy about it. You should, but, but it's just not that black and white in life, is it? Contentment is not determined by circumstance. In fact, the word contented in the Old Testament, it literally uh, was used to describe a fortified city that had everything that it needed within its own walls. So if that city was attacked externally, and, and, and let's say they camped around the outside of that city for three months to try to starve the inhabitants of the city, the inhabitants of the city would survive because everything they needed for survival was actually inside the walls of the city. They didn't need what was outside the walls of the city. It's a great picture of contentment. This is what Paul's kind of getting at. Contentment is not about what's going on outside. It's not about externals. The mystery of contentment can be found inside the walls of the city. The secret of contentment is found in here. It's found within us. It's not dependent on outside circumstances. And then to finish it off, Paul gives us his conclusion on how you find that place of contentment. And he says this, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In other words, contentment is found not in what you have, but it's found in who has you. Contentment's not found in what you have. True contentment is found in who has you. God has you. Think about that for a second. The creator of the universe has you. We stress, don't we? We, 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 we kind of flip it a bit. And we think Christianity is all about us sort of pressing into God. And yes, we press into God. And yes, we need to, 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 to you know, we want to get to know God. We want to seek God. All that. But we kind of feel like our capacity to press is the capacity to which, well, hang on, we, we, we're flipping the script a little bit here. Who's bigger, you or God? Who has the greater love, you for God or God for you? A greater love has no man than this than lay down his life for his friends. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. Sometimes I think we sit back and we think that the church... Think about it. The church has survived for 2,000 years. Are we that good? (laughs) Seriously, we're that good? Mm. We've had a few hiccups along the way, haven't we? We've had a few bad press moments along the way, haven't we? We've had a few catastrophic things that could have shut down this movement and killed the church and stopped people from meeting. We've had a few moments where we felt ashamed and embarrassed of ourselves or embarrassed of the body because of this and because of that. We've had a few moments where we haven't been on top of the mountain. We've been down in the valley. But 2,000 years later, we are sitting in this room together, worshipping Jesus, praising God, grateful, receiving the Holy Spirit, living life uh, to the best of our capacity within the morals and the values and the way that Jesus wants us to live on planet earth right now 2,000 years later let me tell you something we're not that good we can't make this happen see the church doesn't exist because how faithful and committed we are to God it exists because of how faithful and committed God has been to us it's God God has been so committed to his church through the ups and the downs through the good and the bad through the successes and through the failures God is so committed to us he is so for us that we're still here today. That's amazing. That boggles my mind. I think about my own life. I'm still standing today. It ain't because I'm great. It's not because I've nailed it. But I've got a God that loves me. I've got a God that won't let go of me. I've got a God that will never leave me nor forsake me. I've got a God that fills me with his presence and his Holy Spirit. I've got a God that's cheering me on. I've got a God that's behind me, encouraging me, urging me. I've got a God that when I go to do something stupid, whispers in my ear and goes, that's going to be dumb. And when I go ahead and do a dumb thing anyway, he says, it's okay, come back to me. Let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. Here's a clean slate. Let's go on forward in life. That's the God that we serve. And Paul says, you know how I can do everything? I can't do everything by having everything. I can't do everything because I'm so great. I can't do everything because I'm in the right place. I can't do it. The only way I can survive this life, the only way I can maintain a place of contentment is by understanding that I can only do this show contently and with happiness and joy, true joy. I can only do it through him who gives me strength. That's the only way I can navigate my way through this world and stay in a place of contentment. I can't do it anymore any other way it all comes back to jesus it all comes back to jesus in other words if you know jesus then you know the secret of contentment it's a life fixed centered and dependent upon him because he's the one who gives me the strength to deal with whatever life may throw at me whatever life may throw at me yesterday today or tomorrow and who knows what tomorrow is going to look like for me i don't know but i know this i'll handle it through Christ who gives me strength. I know I can. That's the promise of God. And by the way, in case anyone's sitting there going, well, that must have been easy for Paul. Paul's writing this to this group of people in Philippi while he's in a prison in Rome. He's not in the Rome Hilton, in the penthouse suite, sitting back in the spa with a cocktail and some strawberries, telling his mate, now just tell them I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. (laughs) He's in a prison cell in Rome. Restricted. And in the midst of that, in fact, in Philippians, earlier on in that letter, he says this to him. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. And he says this, whether by life or by death. He literally didn't even know if he was going to get out of prison. Here's a guy facing the very real possibility of death, and he says, you know what? But I can handle that, but I can only handle it through Christ, who gives me strength. So when Paul says, I've learnt the secret to contentment, he's got a bit of authority. He knows exactly what he's talking about. You know, when we were in Manly, one of the things that happened there was we had this this Airbnb and it had a a beautiful view of the uh, the ocean. Tiny little little, little place, but it was nice. You opened the door uh, to walk in and the door kept on opening and it blocked the bedroom, entrance to the bedroom. So you had to keep pushing it all the way through to get in. It was pokey, but we had a beautiful view of the ocean. And the whales were popping up and down too and so what they did the people that 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 had the airbnb they gave us binoculars so that we could get the binoculars and we could hold the binoculars up and you could you and you know you could see clearly everything through the binoculars i could get clarity by looking through the binoculars And, and when i read this passage paul saying i can do all things 
through Christ who gives me strength. I think, you know what? In order to, 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 to be able to see with clarity, in order to be able to get the most out of those binoculars, in order to be able to, to actually have the vision I needed, I had to do two things. One, I actually had to, I had to get up close to the binoculars. Can't hold them out here. I've got to get close to the binoculars. And the second thing is I have to make sure that my vision and my focus is I'm looking at the binoculars. You know what? I wonder whether that's kind of what Paul's getting at here. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And how do we do things through Christ? Well, we make sure we're staying close to Jesus. We make sure we're staying close to Jesus. And we make sure that our eyes are fixed on him. You know, the difference between a contented life and a discontented life, I think, is nothing more than 90 degrees. 90 degrees. If, if I want to spend my whole life looking horizontally at everything around me, who's got what, who doesn't have, why don't I, my job, my neighbourhood, my car, or that person, or this, that advertisement, that shop, that sales sign. I think that's a recipe for a somewhat discontented life. What Paul's saying now is, if we would just change our vision 90 degrees and learn to look vertically at God and let everything else be seen through God, just like looking through them binoculars, the more vertical we look, I think this is what Paul's getting at, the more vertical our vision the greater chance we have of actually having a contented life. Regardless of where you are, regardless of what you have, regardless of how you feel about yourself, if we fix our eyes firmly on Jesus, then we give ourselves the best opportunity to actually have a contented life. And I believe that God actually wants us to have a contented life. Amen? I believe in a good God who loves us. He wants us to be content. He wants us to wake up in the morning and actually enjoy today. He wants us to enjoy our day. He wants us, he gave us life and life in abundance. He said a table before us and he invited us to sit down with him and there's some awesome stuff there. But you know what? You will never, ever, 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 ever enjoy life if you don't come to a place of contentment first. Amen? Father, I want to thank you for your word this morning, Lord. I want to thank you. Uh, 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 God, for this, this great insight that Paul gives us into contentment. And that, Lord, we don't need to wait for something external to happen to find contentment. If I just get another job, if I just can pay that bill, if I could just get a promotion, if I can just meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, if I can just, 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 just... Well, Lord, Lord, Paul tells us we don't need that. We've got everything we need to live a contented life right now because we have you. We have Jesus. And so, Father, I pray for each of us, Lord, as just over these next few weeks, that we'd sit back and we'd take stock of our life, we'd think about who we are, where we are, we'd think about our world, Lord, we'd think about those areas, God, where maybe we don't have our eyes on you, maybe we're just looking at other stuff. And, Father, those areas of discontent in our own hearts, Father, Lord, I just pray over the next few weeks, would you do surgery with us, Lord? Dig into those places, Father. Because, God, I do believe that you want us to live and enjoy this life that you've given to us. There are so many things out there screaming at us for attention. So many things out there telling us lies and trying to drag our vision away from you, Father. So just work with us, Holy Spirit, over the next few weeks. Give us insight and wisdom. Speak to us. And use this as another opportunity for us to grow closer to you and to enjoy this wonderful gift of life that you have given to us. And Father, I pray, Lord, as we leave this place today, Every person in this room that has bowed their knee to Jesus, everyone that says they're a follower of you, God, I pray in the next seven days, would you give every one of us an opportunity to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God, somebody out there right now that doesn't know that you love them, that doesn't know what you did on the cross for them, give us the chance to tell them about the goodness of God in the next seven days, Father. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.